When we last left John in a dance with dragons, he wasn't doing so well. In fact, he was lying face down in the snow, dying, having been stabbed in an apparent mutiny against him led by Bowen Marsh. But why exactly was John killed? And how large was this conspiracy? And what on earth was this conspiracy hoping to accomplish at this odd moment in time? And so let's examine the John story of A Dance with Dragons and how it all led to this point. When examining the John story, it's perhaps best to start at the end and look at the scene of the crime. We know John was betrayed by at least four men, Bowen Marsh, Wick Whittlestick, and two mystery men. Wick Whittlestick is the first to slash John, followed by Bowen Marsh's stab in the belly, a third dagger takes John in the back, and one more hits him after he hits the ground. Now, Bowen Marsh's reasons for attacking John are both glaring and exhaustive. First off, it's important to remember that prior to A Dance with Dragons, Bowen Marsh was wary of supporting Stannis. In A Storm of Swords, he was upset about the Night's Watch's property, the gift, being more or less given to Stannis for wildling settlement. We also got a sense that he looked upon Melisandre's religion poorly, and we know from Jon's unintentional spying that Bowen Marsh was fearful of not supporting the Lannister choice for Lord Commander, Janice Slint. And so, as A Dance with Dragons begins, we are reminded of Jon's support for Stannis, in Bowen Marsh's eyes, repeatedly. In John 1, Jon sends Stannis' soldiers to get new gloves from Bowen Marsh. In John 2, Jon executes Janice Slint to Bowen Marsh's clear dismay. And in John 3, Bowen Marsh expresses disapproval of Stannis letting wildlings through the wall, remembering the deaths of his brothers at wildling hands, and complaining about Melisandre's religion. Bowen Marsh even straight up tells John that people think he's too friendly with Stannis, and that the Watch may be doomed if they're on the losing side. But it's also in John 3 that we hear of new grievances against John. Bowen Marsh worries the Wildlings will not keep faith with Stannis and will attack the realm. He calls the Wildlings half-starved, and he mentions his plan for sealing the gates, a plan he has already discussed with first builder Othel Yarwick, and of which half the Night's Watch, the stewards and builders, support. It's then in John 4 that Bowen Marsh shows John Castle Black's food storage facilities and tells of a coming food crisis. In John 5, we hear of Bowen Marsh wanting John to move into the King's Tower to make it look like he doesn't support Stannis. We also hear of Marsh's disapproval of spreading the Watch out amongst its forts, and again of his idea of sealing the gates. He then accompanies John and others to distribute food to the wildlings at Molestown, and observes the near riot. He's then upset about wildlings being brought back to serve in the Watch, complaining of food shortages, possible disloyalty, and disruption that women will cause on the Wall. In the Melisandre chapter, we once again hear about Marsh speaking in support of his idea of sealing the gates, and he complains that rangers shouldn't have been sent out when three are killed. In John 7, Bowen Marsh complains about sending men north of the Wall to take vows, thinking the sept sufficient, and citing the recently killed rangers. In John 8, Bowen Marsh complains about the Watch being spread out again, and wildlings taking command positions, fearing disloyalty. He also says that Satin may not be the best choice for Steward since he's not high-born and a former prostitute, and he wonders about the dead bodies that John puts in the ice cells. He is also upset that Val was sent north of the Wall to bring back Tormund and more wildlings, and is down about the idea of bringing back Mother Mole from Hardhome, citing the food shortage situation. In John 9, Bowen Marsh is there when Selyse arrives, and when John offers her the King's Tower for as long as she likes. In John 10, the Lord of Light wedding ceremony of Alice Karstark and Sigourn of Then is not attended by Bowen Marsh in protest, and he again complains about the food shortage situation. In John 11, Tormund arrives, and again Marsh complains about potential disloyalty of the wildlings and their food consumption. John attempts to ease Bowen Marsh's concerns by saying that wildling treasures will pay for food, and wildling hostages will keep them loyal. Bowen Marsh is unconvinced and declares that letting the wildlings through the wall is treason, saying it goes against their oaths. In John 12, Marsh's tone shows disapproval with the wildling crossing, and in John 13, he speaks of the wildling's ability to attack them from both sides of the wall and his distrust of them. When the hard home situation is brought up, Marsh again brings up the food shortage. And so, in summary, there seems to be about five major grievances that Bowen Marsh has against John, and a few minor ones. Of the major ones, Marsh essentially disagrees with John politically, religiously, logistically, diplomatically, and militarily. 
That is, he disagrees with John supporting Stannis and defending the Lannisters. He disagrees with John tolerating Melisandre and the religion of Valor. He disagrees with John bringing in too many mouths to feed and not dealing with the food shortage situation. He disagrees with John trusting the wildlings, letting them pass through the wall, and giving them positions in the watch. And he disagrees with John sending rangers north of the wall, not sealing the gates, and spreading the watch out amongst its forts. Now we also have some minor miscellaneous grievances, each only mentioned once by Bowen Marsh. Of the minor ones, we have taking on Satin as a steward, seeing if corpses will become whites in the ice cells, and allowing Val to go north against Stannis' wishes. Now these grievances are Bowen Marsh's, and one man is not a conspiracy. However, we have plenty of evidence that Bowen Marsh was speaking with other brothers in the Night's Watch to influence them fairly early on. Mance Raider overhears Marsh talking to brothers about his views, and Bowen Marsh himself repeatedly espouses what men in the Night's Watch think about John's decisions. Bowen Marsh was actively trying to garner support. So who did he convince? Who else was in the mutiny? And what did they value? Well, the only other confirmed conspirator is Wick Whittlestick. We don't know much about Wick Whittlestick. He first appears as a character in A Dance with Dragons, and we know he's a steward. Thus, he's likely to follow his superior first steward, Bowen Marsh. He also appears to be some sort of key master, having keys to the food storage, the ice cells, and presumably many other doors at Castle Black. Though it should be noted that a steward named Mully seems to have keys to the gates for the tunnel, so it may be that there are multiple keys and multiple key masters. And Bowen Marsh seems to have some keys himself. Wick is notably present when Bowen Marsh explains the dire food shortage situation to John in John 4 and puts forward the idea of hunting for more food. Bowen Marsh then says that hunting north of the wall is too dangerous, and by John 8 it's noted that the woods south of the wall have been hunted clean. And so it seems that Wick Whittlestick was also concerned about the food shortage crisis. Now during John's assassination, Bowen Marsh and Wick Whittlestick are accompanied by two mystery men who also stab John. Their identities aren't revealed, but it should be noted that two men are standing with Bowen Marsh and Wick Whittlestick when John tries to rally an army in the Shield Hall a bit earlier. It could be that the mystery men are the two men from the Shield Hall, and these two men are Left Hand Lou and Alf of Ruddy Mud. So, Left Hand Lou is a steward first appearing in A Storm of Swords. He is one of the few survivors of the Great Ranging, the attack at the Fist of the First Men, and the mutiny at Craster's Keep. And we don't get much else about him. He's there when John bids goodbye to Sam and Gilly and Samwell won a Feast for Crows, and appears anxious that they are leaving so late. Perhaps he wanted to get moving and didn't want to travel at night. Lou is also there during Tormund's Crossing in John 12 and observes everything there, but he doesn't say anything and we get no description of him. And so if Left Hand Lou is a conspirator, as his standing near Bowen Marsh implies, his reasons are a bit murky. Perhaps after the disastrous Great Ranging, he agreed with Bowen Marsh and decided that no one should be ranging north of the wall and that the gates should be sealed. We do hear that most stewards feel this way, and he might just be a loyal steward and following first steward Bowen Marsh. Alf of Runny Mud is an unusual character, as unlike Bowen Marsh, Wick Whittlestick, and Left Hand Lou, he's not a steward, but a builder. He is also odd in that unlike most of the Night's Watch who fears Melisandre's religion, Alf converted to the religion of R'hllor. That said, despite being a builder and a follower of the Lord of Light, Alf of Runnymud's motivation for being in the conspiracy is fairly clear. In the Melisandre chapter, three rangers' bodies are returned to Castle Black having been killed, and one of them is Garth Greyfeather, Alf's good friend. Alf is extremely distraught, and we can surmise that after this incident, he began to support Bone Marsh and his belief that the gates should be sealed. So, a conspiracy of at least four. Is that all? Well, no, we do have evidence of a few more. It seems that a man named Molly is also loyal to Bowen Marsh. Molly is a steward who first appeared in A Storm of Swords. He helped defend Castle Black with John, and he seemed rather happy when John won the election for Lord Commander. That said, he is still a steward and personally fought wildlings. Thus, it would not be unusual for him to have soured on John and for him to be loyal to first steward Bowen Marsh. Not to mention, he is present when the bodies of Garth Greyfeather, Harry Hal, and Black Jack Bullworth return to Castle Black. He sees firsthand the despair of Alf of Runnymud. And thus being a steward and observing this scene, and knowing that stewards are generally for the sealing of the gates, it would be probable that Mully would be against John's command decisions. 
But what really makes Mully look suspicious is that he is present when John lets Val go north of the Wall. In a rather similar manner to Bo and Marsh, Mully tells John that the men of the Night's Watch won't like his decision to defy Stannis and allow Val to go free. Of course, saying what the men feel is often really saying what one personally feels. So it could be that Mully himself was a Stannis supporter. What is most significant is that almost immediately after Val goes off, Bowen Marsh comes to see John about Val, and John is shocked how fast news had traveled. John even specifically wonders who the informant is. Of course, it isn't too difficult to figure it out. Only two men observe Val go off, Molly and Dolores Ed, and Molly is the more likely option. Molly also stands out as a conspirator, as Ghost is hostile to him the night of John's assassination. Molly, along with a man named Falk the Flea, are forced to stand guard outside of the armory as Ghost tries to take a bite out of Molly. Of course, Ghost mistrusting Molly is a callback to Grey Wind mistrusting the phrase before the Red Wedding. In both cases, Rob with Grey Wind and John with Ghost, the warg ignores his direwolf's intuition. And so, considering that Mully is a steward, reported on Val's departure, and the fact that Ghost mistrusts him, we can be fairly confident that Mully was in on things. So, a five-man conspiracy? Well, we do have some evidence of another disloyal brother, and that brother is Clytus. Clytus is a steward first appearing all the way back in A Game of Thrones. He is near blind and was Maester Aemon's personal steward for a number of years. And notably from those duties, it seems Clytus has picked up some of a maester's ability. John thinks Clytus has perhaps one-tenth of Maester Aemon's knowledge, but when you think about it, that's a fair amount. And we will talk more about Clytus' knowledge in future parts. Now, although Clytus was introduced all the way back in A Game of Thrones, we know relatively little about him. He doesn't speak very often, and people don't speak of him very often. That said, we are fairly confident that Clytus is a Lannister supporter and is not backing Stannis. Now what makes us fairly certain that Clytus is backing the Lannisters is that in Cersei IV of Feast for Crows, Cersei receives an update from Janice Slint at the Wall on Stannis' plans with the Wildlings and the Lands of the Night's Watch. And this is a pretty big deal as there are only three people at Castle Black who know how to send messages with ravens. There's Maester Aemon, Sam, and Clytus and I can't imagine either Sam or Aemon sending a raven for Janice Slint. So by process of elimination, we're almost certain that it was Clytus that sent the raven for Janice Slint. In fact, timing-wise, it's most likely that Janice sent his message in John 2, between storming out of John's office and the breakfast where he was beheaded. This would explain why he was so cocky in the morning, boasting about his powerful friends, when he was angry and frustrated the day before. And this whole episode between John and Janice Slint occurs after Eamon and Sam have left, so it would actually be impossible for Eamon or Sam to have sent the letter. So it seems that Clytus secretly sent a letter for Slint, hinting that he's a Lannister supporter. Additionally, it should be noted that Eamon asks Clytus to highlight a section in the Jade Compendium for John. John reads the passage about Azor High having a warm sword and tells Clytus that Stannis' sword is cold. So essentially, John reveals to Clytus that Aemon, Clytus' mentor for years, believed Stannis to be a fraud. And thus, Clytus being a steward, a Lannister supporter, and thinking Stannis a fraud, it seems highly likely that Clytus would follow first steward Bowen Marsh, a man with similar political beliefs. So, a six-man conspiracy. Well, no. In fact, the conspiracy is likely much, much larger than six men, but these are the men we know the names of, and they act as a good starting point for figuring out what exactly happened in the final John chapter. It is notable that these men are mostly stewards, but they also include a builder. Additionally, they have a varied set of grievances. Clytus likely backs the Lannisters and not Stannis, who he feels is a fraud. Wick Whittlestick likely worries about the food crisis, Alf of Runnymud, after the death of his friend, likely wants the gates sealed and an end to ranging north of the Wall. Mully seemed rather focused on Val, and Bowen Marsh clearly doesn't like anything John does. But there is most certainly many more men in the conspiracy, as the Watch as a whole was acting very odd the night of John's murder. Keep in mind, the night of the mutiny, John orders a meeting at the Shield Hall, which seats about 300, but only about 50 Black Brothers show up. This is odd as nearly 400 Night's Watchmen are stationed at Castle Black. Where is everyone else? And then afterwards, there's the incident with one the Giant at Hardin's Tower. John observes Queensmen, Northmen, and Free Folk pouring onto the scene. 
but we get no mention of the Night's Watch. This is particularly odd as 1-1 is in front of Hardin's Tower, which is supposed to have guards posted. The only Black Brothers on the scene seem to be John's Tail, Horse and Rory, and John's Assassins. But speaking of John's Tail, didn't they do a rather poor job in protecting him? They must have either been overwhelmed by additional conspirators, or been in on the conspiracy as well. And so the Night's Watch as a whole does seem to be up to something. But we can start with the conspirators we know. And so next time we will re-examine the day John was assassinated with the conspiracy in mind and try to figure out what's really going on. And so we'll see you in part two. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.